Well, boys and girls, we are here on a Monday evening. I don't care for Mondays, but look who we got. Mondays, all the better. This is Turn the Pot with Doc and Kate. And my very special guest, a returning Mr. Chris Dozer. Thank you, my friend, for stopping in and hanging with us on Stirring the Pot. It's my pleasure, Don. Thank you for having me again for round two. A absolutely. I, I put a little status on last week. Uh, anybody want to sit down with uh, this stupid bastard? And you were the first one of the first ones to say, what's good? So uh, I really do appreciate that because it's always kind of hard doing the old, hey, you want to do an interview? Hey, you want to do an interview? So I figured I'd just kind of put it out there, Mr. Dozer. And Saturday, I interviewed one Jacqueline Sparks and Her one anti-hero, Mr. Chaz Marinelli. So this is kind of all of those over. interviews. Yes. Oh, thank you, my friend. I'm glad that somebody watches it besides my father. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> this kind you of got fans, brother. You got fans. That's what, 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 you're doing me a favor by doing this because not only do we talk wrestling and get get, get all the agita out from you know, not mm -hmm. doing anything for the last you know nine months, but uh, you, you're doing us a favor by putting our names out there and. You, you're doing a favor to the business that you don't even really know you're doing just because you love it. So that's why I have absolutely no problem coming back on here with you. I love talking wrestling. Brother. I appreciate all of those kind words. I don't get a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you've seen my face page today, but so. there's a picture of me hanging in the middle of the air, like magic. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, and, I was shredding the cheese at work today because I work at a pizza joint. I was shredding the cheese and I wanted to mix it up a little bit on a Monday, on a Monday afternoon. So instead of standing on the ground and shredding cheese on the old Hobart, if you will, yep. I did some magic and I was doing it. Uh, I, they call me Neo at work now uh, after, <laughs> woo, after the one, the one from the Matrix. Uh, you should go look at that face page uh, picture. Hey, dude, I saw it. Uh, uh, you, you did. You were in the Matrix, brother. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Like now, do I miss? Now, the reason I couldn't do that. <laughs> now, the reason why I bring, I even remotely bring that up, is because I knew that I had one Mister Dozer making his return today. Now, we haven't talked in about six months. It was back in May, which brings us full circle. Miss Jacqueline Sparks, Mister Antihero. Uh, and Mr. Dozer, I kind of interviewed you guys in the same time frame, and here we are, all again, full circle, about six months pr uh, past this whole King COVID bullshit that still got <laughs> King COVID. You see, no, never mind. All right, so it still got us stuck in the house. We're doing wacky oh. things out there. Shit's closing, shit's opening. Okay, so for me to stop talking, uh, this is the reason why I bring up this picture because six months ago I talked to Mr. Dozer, and I usually, when I do interviews, I like to kind of take the reins, if you will, and give, you know, maybe a question here, a question there, and we kind of feed off of that, right? Right, right, but, right. But since I mix it up, shredding the cheese today, I'm mixing it up right here tonight on oh, Stirring boy. the Pot with my friend Chris Dozer, because we're not going to do the same old format. Hey, how you doing? Uh, blah, blah, blah. And lead into the next question and lead into the next question. This is what I'm doing tonight, my friend. I'm letting you, Chris Dozer, this may be fucking dangerous as hell. I don't <laughs> know what's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to go. But to mix it up a little bit, I want to let Mr. Dozer just start talking. What's in the brain? We've been down for a while. Uh, what's going on? Uh, and, and whatever you want to start with, I am going to let you it's been four and a half minutes already, and I'm yakking like a motherfucker on cocaine. But I don't do cocaine. Just want to let you know. Um, so why don't you take the reins and give us Mr. Dozer's thoughts? Because you don't just reach out for nothing. You've obviously no. got something to say. So you know what? You take the reins. I'll kick back a little bit. I think I might even fire up a smoke. And I'm curious on what's on Mr. Dozer's mind. So with all of that bullshit that i just said take it away my friend mr dozer i'm stirring the pot all right brother thank you well listen 
Like you're far too hard on yourself, my friend. Trust me. I love hearing you talk. I, I tune in this I tune in to watch you talk with all the guests. Like I said, I watched Jacqueline Sparks and Chaz Marinelli's interview on Saturday. It was phenomenal. Must Thank watch. You. Go watch it. Um, but as far as I go in my reality, um there's a lot of things that have changed, so to speak. I mean, back when you know we closed in May, we, we had the chop shop, it was still a thing, it was still an entity, it was still rolling and all of the companies there within places like Proven Ground, Rhode Island Championship Wrestling, um, Watch This Fight, RWA, you name it, they all ran out of the same building. And then, you know, July, the rug gets pulled off from under us, we lose the building. Um, and, you know, I wish I had updates as to whether we're going to open again or not, you know, but there have been some changes as a part of where I'm going to wrestle again. Uh, because there's been a lot of upheaval, so to speak, in my uh, personal friends list, uh, personal bullshit, and, you know, stuff gets in the way a lot of the time, um, and personal disagreements, that the drama that bleeds into wrestling, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't, wrestling is its own drama-filled world, and man, the outside influences and the outside bullshit, it gets in the way a lot of the times. Um, so I, this is a Kincaid Files exclusive on starting the pot. Uh, I will no longer be wrestling for RWA. Uh, oh, due wow. to, uh, due to uh, my own personal viewpoints on what's going on and uh, my own experiences. And I'm not going to delve into that. That's a personal matter. These be held, handled face to face. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, for the here and the now and for the, for the, for the future, I'm not going to be working at RWA anymore. Oh, wow. Uh, breaking news from breaking news from one Mr. Dozer. Oh, it's it's again, it's the personal bullshit. And you know, when I express an opinion and uh, I get flack for it, and I uh, because of my way I feel personally, I feel I get attacked for it because I have an opinion. Uh, I disagree with that. Like it's an open forum, um, and I the one thing you got to know about me is I'm a straight fucking shooter, right? I'm not gonna bullshit anyone. I'm not gonna blow smoke. Come to me for an opinion. I'm going to give you an opinion, and a lot of times I'm going to give you an opinion whether you don't want it, whether you want it to or not. So I'm, it's going to happen. Um, so that's the first thing foremost I want to get off my plate and off my chest is uh, you know as much as I've uh, fought, bled, fought, scratched, and clawed in that company, it's just not going to happen anymore. Well, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that. I hate I hate seeing the talent uh, having to move on because of whatever's happening in the back, uh, in the locker rooms, if you will. Uh, so I do, I am sad by that because we like to see our talent, you know, uh, spread out as much as we can. Uh, but again, personal, personal choices have to be made at times. So all we can do is say uh, the best of luck, whatever uh, you have going on in the future and wherever you, you know, you end up and stuff. And I know the RICW uh, family over there, because as I spoke to uh, Mr. Marinelli and, and Miss Sparks, uh, they're looking forward from, from mm -hmm. what their words were. They were going to look forward to the future. What it holds, they don't know. But I don't think, uh, you know, these companies that were under the one umbrella, if you will, I think they're still going to thrive. There will be a home. Uh, will they all be under the same umbrella? We don't know. Uh, right. So we're, we, we as fans, and I'm just asking Ms. Sparks and Ms. Mar uh, Mr. Marinelli because I know they didn't have the answers right now. Uh, right. But I was just kind of seeing maybe if they had some insight. So their insight was, we are going to be moving forward. If we're all under the same umbrella, that's cool. If we're not, that's cool too. So right. with that being said, I, 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 I am sad to see you move on. But hey, sometimes we got to do what we got to do. Sometimes in order to take a step forward, you have to take a step back. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I don't wish them any ill will. I love all the guys down there and, you know, Right. Whatever it may be, once it blows over, who knows what the future holds. But you know, for the here and now, that's the way it's going to be is in, in my life. Um, okay. But well, I mean, you know, again, you, there's so many moving parts with, with, with a building like that, and you have so many organizations running out, and it's so dependent upon that one ring, that one building, that one sh uh, that one location. It's hard. It's hard because you're never going to find the perfect building, right? You know, the chop shop had its flaws. It was in an old factory. There was no heat. There was no AC. It was cold in the, in the winter. It was hot as balls in the summer. 
uh, and you know, it just it, you're in a mill, so it's just you didn't you didn't have the capacity to really pack that place out, or or you know, you always had to worry about if you did pack the place out, what was going to happen? Why the, the cops going to show up? Why are all these cars in the parking lot? Right. And you never know how the cops are going to react to that shit. And you know, we as as much as you know, we tried to abide by the rules and whatnot. You know, you never know how people will react if they come in and see it. So it's it, it's tough because now you have, you're stuck looking for a place in the middle of a pandemic, and one you know people are really really gun shy about wrestling because you have to have your insurance uh, paid up front and you have to make sure you have proof of insurance uh, because in case anything happens, any injuries happen in the building, God forbid. You have to make sure your eyes are dotted and your T's are crossed because you never fucking know. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, like the 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 the, the, the mainstream world and their view on you know indie wrestling in general uh, is not a positive, so to speak. Everyone looks at it as you know, ooh, you're a wrestler. Oh God, fuck. Now, now, can I pause you right there? Just a quick second. I hate to interrupt. Yep. Nope. Uh, I, I do. I do feel that. As a fan that goes from promotion to promotion to promotion in a few different states, I do feel that, that the mainstream uh, <clears throat> down on the old indies. But mm-hmm. let, I, I just want to take your statement and put a little perspective. Because what we're seeing on AEW, what we're seeing on Impact Wrestling, and not only that, what we're seeing in, in the, big, the big kahuna, Itself, WWE, with the NXT brand, we are seeing them thrive. Those specific companies, plus a couple others, uh, we are seeing them thrive. MLW is another one. We're seeing them thrive off of the independent scene. I just don't get it, my man. I don't get it. Please carry I, on. I, it's one of those things that's always boggled my mind because uh, it, we're in, in the end, we're trying to do what a lot of other businesses are trying to do. We're trying to appeal to a broad fan base. And while it's a niche audience that loves wrestling, um, we're trying to get people in to see the product. And, and the more eyes on the product, the more money that comes in. The more people come in through the door. They want to pay to see live events. Uh, so it's no different than a T-shirt company. It's no different than a, a television company or you know any of the bigger guys that try to run. It's just it's really, really hard because the over – the overhead a to start a company is massive it's it, it's an undertaking that's it, it's very financially burdensome now on top of that you know you have to find a building that fits your needs spatial constraints come into play uh, there's been buildings i've wrestled in where the where the the clearance at the top from the top rope to the ceiling was less <laughs> than four feet so that immediately takes top rope out of the equation any any type of you know you know presses up the top rope or uh, springboards, done. Um, then there was re- you know, places I've wrestled in where you know you couldn't work to one side of the ring because there was a pottery shop next door, and God forbid you touch the wall and knock over hundreds of dollars of pottery, uh, now you're out that money. And mm-hmm. you, you have a lot of the, these buildings are big buildings, and you're sharing the places with tenants. And you're either upstairs or downstairs or next door, and and – some places don't fucking like you for whatever reason. They don't like you. They don't like your brand. They don't like the, the, the clientele you bring in. They don't like the fact you're a wrestler. They don't like the fact you make noise. Um, so you have to have like a building that's suited to your needs. And finding something like that is like finding a needle in a needle stack. Not a haystack, a needle stack. Because it, there's buildings big, small, and in between that, well, could work, will not work in the long term. Mm-hmm. Uh, when people do these uh, start starting up a promotion, I've seen some. I'm not saying all. I have seen some that have come up and disappear. Yep. And and I th- and I I really it has to. I mean, and my, from my fan my perception as a fan, um, I'm I'm assuming um, it's some of those financial things that you talk about because holy crap, a it's not easy. B, it's not cheap. And three, uh, C, <laughs> B and three. No, uh, C, <laughs> C, you need <clears throat> you need a fucking army to get this done. 
Just one show itself, one event takes an army, takes a village. So I, I think from my perspective with what you've said, I mean, I've thought about other things on why they disappear. Um, but, you know, that monetary part, I think is probably the biggest part of why they think it's all cool to start a promotion. And then they realize, oh, holy shit, this is hard. I thought it was going to be easy peasy. Yeah, it's one of those things where you don't – when you go to start a promotion, you, you you have a core group of people you start the promotion with, right? Like, oh, we got good wrestlers. We've got good product. We've got good this. We've got good that. But then, you, then, you know, you have to worry about lighting. You have to worry about camera work. You have to worry about music. You have to worry about audio equipment. You have to worry about video editing and, and, and how you're going to capture all of that and present your product. Then you have to worry about banners and uh, – displaying your product. You don't worry about merch tables and, and, and making sure that the fans who want refreshments have those refreshments. And on top of that, you have to make sure that the, the facilities are taken care of, like the restrooms, because you have to have, you know, clean running water. You have to have bathroom stock with toilet paper and paper towels and hand soap. It's, it's, it's mind boggling when you start to undertake these tasks, how much you don't know until you're faced with running a show and you have to put it all together yourself and you're scrambling. <laughs> The guys wearing different hats. Some guys work audio and then work a match later on that night because they're workers too. And then exactly. you have to find guys filling in the spot for the match. And then it's 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 a it's a it's a fucking madhouse, man. And I, my hats are off to every promotion that's been successful and maintain that because it's extremely hard to do. A lot of guys run run two three shows. They run for a year, realize it's not fucking worth it. They'll cut their losses and they'll. They'll book it back to you know just working independent shows where they get paid to work, yeah. as opposed to them shelling up the money themselves to work. Uh, now I'm not trying to dive. Uh, one quick ultra second, please, sir. I'm right here. Ba -ba -ba that was quick ultra second. Um, I'm not trying to. I guess in layman's terms, stir the pot. I'm not trying to do that. Uh, but with this question, but what I've also seen as a fan. And sometimes I have the absolute privilege and the absolute honor to be able to cross that guardrail, if you will, that imaginary line, mm -hmm. and be able to speak some of the talents, the promoters and such, hang out in the locker rooms with the talents and the promoters and such. Uh, there's not a lot of fans, especially way back when. That was, a, that was the biggest no-no, uh, to, to have a fan come in the back. Breaking kayfabe, Don. And, and and have those eyes <laughs> and have those eyes <laughs> see what wrestling you know what how the the gears of wrestling work uh, right. so for me as a fan being able to take my phone and do my ridiculous uh, shtick I am so honored and privileged to be able to cross that line but my question is I've also noticed in some promotions that let's see you have a core, okay? And I'll, uh, I'll just use some of your, your guys, for instance, just as an example. Uh, we have Mr. Dozer, we have Miss Sparks, we have Mr. Marinelli, we have the Chris Pyros, we have, we have the Davey Cashes, and we have the, 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 the heavy hitters, and we have all of these cats that are on our core roster, okay? But what, what many promotions do, and not all of them, they'll get that one guy, that's got a name that everybody knows to bring in uh, fans, which returns to the money portion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, my question, I'm getting to that. My question is, uh, is it very detrimental for a promotion to do that? Because, uh, I mean, my, my reasoning and my questioning of this is because I've kind of seen the guys on the outskirts of the names being like, what the fuck? I've been here. I've been putting in the time. I've been putting in the ring work and all of this over the past, you know, couple months or whatever. And I'm not even saying it's a, it's a time frame, it, but when they bring in that name, that name is getting a good pay comparing right. to the rest of the roster that's there as your core roster for that promotion. I've seen it. Yeah. Um, it do you feel? That's very detrimental to promotions that do that. Again, 
the way I look at bringing in names, I work hand in hand with with Chaz and with Jacqueline at Rhode Island Championship Wrestling, and I've had firsthand knowledge. I help with the booking and whatnot down there. Uh, <clears throat> you have to have a the bankroll to support that, right? And you have that name has to be big enough to make sure that motherfucking building is packed out. Like that name has to be big enough to generate a, that that type of paycheck. One, like if you can get. The Undertaker, for whatever. It'll never happen, but you, you, it takes $10,000 to get the Undertaker through the fucking door. You better be gating $15,000. Minimum. Minimum. Otherwise, you'll never break even. Mm-hmm. So you have to justify the, the want to bring in that name mm-hmm. with how much it's going to cost you, first off. And then you also have to worry about, in the back of your mind, how the people in the locker room are going to feel about that. Because that guy coming in and taking that spot for that night, that means one of your guys that brought you to that show and brought you to that point doesn't get that spot. And that that has to be explained and sat down and talked to about them because it's not going to fucking sit well. I've seen it happen countless times where people will sell out and bring in names and spend thousands of dollars to bring in you know ex-WWE guys and ex-Impact guys, and they don't draw as well because they're not as well-known. And perhaps you didn't promote it properly. So you have, it's, it's, a, it's a huge risk. It's a huge risk bringing in names. You have to, right off the bat, if you're going to do that, you have to say, okay, this is what I want to do. This is where I see myself going with this promotion. And, and, and you have to have a vision with it. Otherwise, if you're bringing in names, just to bring in names, you're pissing money down the drain, man. It really, it really is not cost effective at all. And, 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 and what surrounds it with the core roster is usually unsettled, uh, yep. not ha- not happy workers at all. You have to you have to, you have to deal with that that aftermath. And, and and one thing about wrestlers is you'll get a group of wrestlers in the you know in a locker room, and half of them will agree and half of them will disagree. And you know, you have, I've seen friendships, lifelong friendships, get lost because of it. Uh, you know, partnerships. Get dissolved overnight because it was because of a stupid decision or a poor decision or a decision that was wasn't run through proper channels. You know what I'm saying? Like those things. At the end of the day, is it worth it? And if you de- deem it is worth it, then you better be right. Uh, I feel I feel that that monetary part of it. If you're bringing in the guy, that place better be wall like jammed wall to wall. Because if you don't, uh, a you're like you said, you're gonna lose out. But I, I think even on the latter part of it, of the the your core guys and girls that are surrounding this name that you have brought in for X night for whatever X reason, um, I feel the monetary uh, part of it is obviously a on you. You better figure out a way to get it done. But b I just don't understand. Why you, why you would want to piss your fucking roster off like that? It just does not make any sense to me. I will tell you this. Unless you're a place like, you know, Limitless in Maine, who has a you know a huge following. And that I, I hats off to the gentleman who runs it. it, it if you're not, not looking in the big picture like that, you're going to do far more harm than good. Because then people are going to say, fuck this, I'm out. They're going to bail on you. And then... Six months down the road, when you're trying to book a show with no names on it, oh, you're going to have to pay that guy to come in. And that guy's going to say, well, how much did you pay him? Give me some of that. Mm-hmm. And it just it just, it just adds tension to a locker room when it doesn't need to be tension. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, it, it's going to you're, you're gonna end up having constant battles in the back. And that's where some of the drama of wrestling comes in because people get feelings hurt really easy. And it's hard. Those are the hard conversations to have with people. I, I could never imagine. I wouldn't want to be the guy who's got to tell uh, my boys and girls, hey, we're bringing an X and he's going to cost me 500 bucks. And I know I, I usually give you guys maybe 20 bucks, but tonight you're getting nothing. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's a hard pill to swallow, especially guys who drive yes. an hour or so, two hours away. Yeah, they're, looking for the, they're not looking for to break the bench. They're looking to just get some gas money in their tank and they're getting hey. stiffed. Because you want to book Joe Blow. And and I've always said that as a musician, too. 
uh, when I was going out there, um, I was our booker for the band. Um, I, I take, took care of our web page, our face page. Um, I did, I made the posters. I sent the posters. Um, I, I mean, I did like 90, if not more percent of the work just so we could be out there jamming on that stage because that's where I wanted to be. Not in the fucking basement practicing, you know? So when, when we would go out there, I would say, this is our base price. We have five guys. Some would look at me sideways and I'd be like, listen, man, I'm not here to get rich because we know that I'm in a cover band. I've got four other guys to deal with. One is in, is in Massachusetts. One is in Enfield. One is coming from Hopeville, fucking Rhode Island. Oh. My boy would drive all the way there to Bristol just to practice. Wow. So... So I, I, I feel your I feel your pain on that conversation of now you got to tell the boys, hey man, we didn't make X uh, money tonight because X uh, X venue owner was being a pain in my balls, you know, kind of thing. So I feel that, and I've always correlated music with wrestling. It's very similar in many aspects. I had one gig, and this is the reason why I bring it up. I had a gig at Dogata. We were promised X amount because I brought our soundboard. I did sound for X band. So we were already promised X amount for just bringing that board in and then X amount from the door. Motherfucker, I made a hundred bucks for the five of us. Do you want to see some pissed off motherfuckers? Holy shit. I had to deal with that. I had to deal with that. Not the venue, uh, not the venue guy. Right. Uh, I had, I've had, I can't tell you how many times, Don, I've had shows where I've driven, you know, three, four hours, promised a payday, and nothing big, just gas in my tank, maybe mm -hmm. enough to get to stop and get, you know, a cheap fast food meal, and because the 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 event for whatever reason didn't draw, I get stiffed. Like, mm -hmm. and those are the things, those are double edged swords. Where like, there's no guaranteed money in wrestling. Unless you're signed to a contract, there ain't no fucking guaranteed money. So you go to a show, you go out, you put on the product, you bust your ass, regardless whether there's five fans or 500 or 5,000. And you come to the back, you're looking for your, your envelope, and there is no envelope to be had, or the envelope's light. And now, now you're looking for someone's head to fucking rip off, because I was promised something, and I'm not getting it. I want answers as to fucking why. Yes. Services rendered, my friend. Services fucking rendered. Absolutely. And I've, I've gone that route with venue owners. Uh, like you said, the old light envelope, I, I would always get paid by hand. This fucking guy, it was the first time we played there, he gives me an envelope after set one. I grab the envelope, I go to put it in my pocket, I squish it a little bit, I go, nah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> and I mean, I'm Mr. Up, Dozer, brother. <laughs> Mr. Dozer, you've seen me? You've met me. I'm a hundred and fucking 30 pounds on my best day in my entire life. But I'll tell you one thing. I am not afraid to tell this guy that he is shorting me and my guys. I'm not having it. I will raise my voice. I will say some words that has to be said. Son of a bitch. If I didn't get that extra little bit back in my envelope. But my point being is you don't always get that kind of, uh, you don't get that return. Always. Right. Sometimes right. when you put up a stink, it's always, it's not always, hey, here's a little extra. I'm sorry. That was my bad. Most of the time, it's like, eh, tough shit. Yep. Yeah. Listen, we're all, especially in the, in the levels of wrestling we're doing, we're all, we all have our own shoot jobs, right? We're not, we're not relying off this to, 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 right. to, to pay us. This is just a sideline. But the effort you put in with your gear, your training, the, the gas you put in your car to get to and from tra training and then to and from shows and the mental energy you expel and then putting your body on the line for, for 50 bucks or 60 bucks. Like it's, you want to see, I don't care how big or how small you are. You, you, you start fucking with people's money. You're, you're looking for, you're looking for a bad evening. And it really twists people head after like what you're saying, all of the preparation to get there. And you're not looking for, you know, I, I did X amount of years of training and I did X amount of this and, I do, and I've done this. You're not looking for, you owe me $10,000 for tonight's show. Just a little something, something. And I've always said that to my guys. 
I will play live for a fucking quarter. But Jesus Christmas, give me that fucking quarter. Don't blow me off for you, you know. Like if you're gonna right. give me something, give me something. Like at least get like it. Like, again, this is, this is. I'm not doing it. I'm not charging you to bust your balls or I'll put you over a barrel. It's not what I'm trying to do. And I, 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 I have never charged someone more than a hundred dollars for a booking. God's honest truth, because I don't see myself as, you know, Hey, you can give me that fucking 200, 300 bucks. Come on. No, no, no. I never charge any more than a hundred for it. And that's only depending on how far I have to go to that show. That was in fucking Maine. I drove for that thing. That was two <laughs> tanks of gas. And I slept in my car that night. Wow. So it's one of those fucking things where I'm not looking to break the bank. There's no way once you join the rest, once you join wrestling, that you'll ever break even. That you'll ever, ever you get into the get into the black, yep. because you won't. You won't. And if you come in with that mindset, you're fucking nuts. Because the amount of money you put in for training costs, dues, you know, ring rentals, whatever it may be, and then you know, your gear on top of it, and then whatever it may be going to and from these venues. You will never, I repeat, never see that money back. It's just the money for the inconvenience. You know what I'm saying? It's the money for like, hey, you could have been somewhere else tonight. You could have sat home with your family. Instead, you chose to be here four hours away from your family. Let me give you a little mm -hmm. something. Just to make sure it's worthwhile. And I, I'll tell you what. A lot of places north of the border of Massachusetts were fucking phenomenal because they understood that. There are a couple places here and there. Not so much, because you know you, you get your name out there. Hey, let me get well, let me get you for you know a match. You're on first or second, and you don't never see the promoter again. Yeah, you know, fuck it. I guess I'm not getting paid tonight. But it's it's one of those things where you know a lot there's a lot of good reputable guys out there that are honest, hardworking guys that will give you something. Um, at least for your struggle and your and your inconvenience. But mm -hmm. man. When those nights, when you come across that one fucking prick who, hey, man, I promoted, I promoted, I promoted. I was expecting 200 people in here and only fucking six people showed up. That's a you problem, brother. It's a you problem. That's not a me problem. That's not a everyone else in the problem. So if I, if I see you giving an envelope to X guy wrestler over there, there better be another fucking envelope for <laughs> every other motherfucker here. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the way and, it should and, be, yes. See, for me, for, well, for you know, I wrestle mainly out of Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts. I live in Vermont. So I made a deal a long time ago with, with Chaz and with that I never asked for a payday. And you can ask him this as the guy's honest with I've never asked for a fucking payday. I've never gotten a dime from them. I've never asked for a dime from them because I believe in the product and I'm trying to put the product over, right? And that's not to say other guys shouldn't get paid because they should, uh, you know, especially if they're if they're drawing well and they're performing up to the standards we expect them to. Absolutely, pay them. I've never asked for a dime from them because I'm trying to make sure this company, Rhode Island Championship Wrestling, is established, is turned in the right direction, and when I'm done wrestling, it's there for years to come for other people like me who want to come in and. And, and and get a taste of the business, um, but like some three and a half hours, half a tank of gas, two hundred miles. You know you have to leave here at like one o'clock to get there by four thirty by call time. It's 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 a stress. It's it's definitely an inconvenience. It's definitely a hassle, and it's definitely a struggle. And you know, there's nights where you we gate some, get we get a little, we all get a little money. I can go out to eat. Be happy with it. You know what I'm saying? There's nights that we didn't get a lot. Where fuck it. No, no. I'll just go home and I'll eat some fucking, you know, can ravioli or something. Yeah. But those those are the struggles with, with, with where we're at, you know what I'm saying? And I accept that. And I that's that's because I trust Chaz. I trust Jacqueline. I I believe in what we're doing. And I believe that much in wrestling in general that I'm trying so hard to just make this place a destination right for other guys we can start getting people in and then everyone gets paid you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so like that's the deal i made with them i don't make it with everybody but that's the deal i made with them and I'm, like i said i can i can count the number of times on two hands and two feet how many times i've gotten paid and it's never what you think you're worth 
It's just, hey, uh, let me fill your tank for you. Okay, cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. I feel you there, my friend. At one point, I was at the, I, I, I was kind of maybe going to sweep wrestling to the side because I was going to like 15 fucking shows a month, my man. May it be Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. I was hitting that, that tri-state area and I was, I would drive two hours. I would drive two hours, 20 minutes. Um, I, and then as I was doing those events, I'm feeling, man, I always said two hours is my maximum. I don't know. Two hours is kicking my fucking balls. And I'm just a fan going there and doing my thing, you know? So it was being uh, something costly for myself. Yeah. And I've, I've never, Mr. Dozer, never once. I've been in the indie scene for probably four, maybe working on four and a half years or so. Not one time. And I will stress, there is not one time that I've ever walked into a promotion because they know me. They know my shtick. They know that I share the footage. They know that I do this on the tube or whatever. Never once have I asked them, can I get in for free? I've always supported the fucking company I've walked in the door for. May it be $5, $10, $20. Never <laughs> once have I ever asked. Has it been handed to me on a handful of occasions? Yes, it has. They would, I would give them my money. Be like, bro, you ain't giving me your fucking money tonight. In my heart, Mr. Dozer, it just makes me feel so warm that they're giving me that respect. And like I said, it's, if it's happened a handful of times, I'd be very surprised. Uh, there was one company that would always let me go for free. Never charged myself for my father, which I was just fucking blown away. I right. mean, absolutely blown away. Uh, but, but, but I'm stressing the point of I've always supported the companies. I've always bought merch. May it be a fucking sticker, a button, uh, a shirt. I've always tried to give that because that's what I'm here for. I'm not here to fucking yep. leech off of you guys and girls at the shows, you know? Um, so when the it's, offer is there, yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, and that's the thing, Don, is for you to do that as a fan, that's incredible. It's, it's, it, that's the type of fan we want and we want coming back because – it's a reward and for, for the for the chop shop. We've had a couple of core guys like Corey Lank or Ed Tellier and his son, Aiden, uh, Ethan Morin, uh, a handful of others that we could rely on 10 times out of 10. Snow, rain, fucking hail, you know, tornado, fucking earthquake. <laughs> they'd be there at showtime waiting to get in and they'd always be willing to pay. And it's it, it warms my heart because I know that, like you said, they're supporting the product. They're going to come in. They're going to buy refreshments. They're going to come in. They're going to buy our fucking merch because that's how much they love it. And those are the guys we want come back. Those are the fans we want to bring in because the, they are, you are worth your weight in gold. And you have no idea what it is because to have a crowd, to have a fan coming in, guaranteed reactions, guaranteed he's going to, he's going to get the crowd when it starts to die a little bit. He's going to get them back involved at, just by his excitement and exuberance for it that's the, that's the fans we drive to get and strive to get and and the, that when you get those moments where we comp you it's not just for you it's for us it's thanking you brother because without you we're wrestling in front of an empty building with god knows whoever's going to follow us on youtube and no reaction whatsoever you know what i'm saying like i i rather have 10 fans like you than 100 fans who don't sit on their hands, don't make a sound, and stay on their phones all day. One of my favorite things to do is when it's a little hush-hush and the peeps aren't really doing a whole lot, I will <laughs> I will fucking yell, Frost, you suck if he's there or not. I will, <laughs> 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 I will get looked at, but I don't give a shit. But it starts a little something-something. Uh, may it be Frost, you suck, or may it be something else. If it's dead, and I mean, I, I'm not always active because I can't always be active. I, I start losing my mind a little bit. I start feeling like I'm going to pass out because I've been screaming at fucking the last eight guys coming out on my <laughs> the top of my lungs looking like a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> you need to drink once in a while too, man. And there, has, water. 
<laughs> there, no, 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 no. We do not leave our seat. But there has been times, sir, that I shit you not. I'm sitting there and I've got like three fucking matches to go. And I'm like, I'm going to fucking pass out. Yeah. I'm dying. I didn't yeah. get enough fucking supplement in my body. I didn't get enough this or that. And I've been screaming like a jackass for well over two hours. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, especially when we're wrestling mill shows, right? You know, and you, middle of winter, middle of January, there's no heat in the building. And we're only getting heat from a propane heater in the corner of the fucking room. It's wide open. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are freezing your balls off. We're freezing our balls off. And we're, you know, like, oh, oh, let me tell you, it's it's hard. It's hard. Or the flip side, when it's 97 degrees outside with 80% humidity and everyone, the minute you walk through the door, it's soaked in sweat. But that's what wrestling, that's a big part of wrestling, sir. And I, and I know we've spoken how many aspects it takes to get together to make an event um, and, and all of that. But that's another aspect. We do it together. Mm -hmm. The fans, the wrestlers, the promoters. And, and, I, and I know not everybody sees it that way. But we do it together with what you just said. When it's fucking freezing. Do you want to know something? I'm going to tell you a real ultra quick story. There was a company in my state that was supposed to run on X date. This was uh, two years ago. Well, they run out of... Uh, 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 um, a town controlled building. So it was snowing. And I mean, it was a fucking blizzard. There must have been 10 inches out on the ground and it was still fucking coming down. Yeah. So that show got canceled. Yeah. Well, I started poking on the face page. I'm like, I want to do something tonight. I found up in Ludlow, Battlefront Pro Wrestling was having their very first show. I go, son of a bitch. I call my dad. I go, hey, pop. I go, blah, 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 canceled. I go, how about we go and check out a new place? He goes, where is it? I go, Ludlow, Mass. He goes, you're fucking crazy. It's a blizzard out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, all right, that's cool. I'll find somebody else. I made a couple more calls. I got my 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 nephew, Stephen, out of Forestville. I went and picked him up. We drove to Ludlow, Mass. in a fucking blizzard in my Ultima. It took us a, a, now a normal ride to get there is about an hour from my place. Well, not now, but where I used to live is about an hour. It took us an hour and a half to get there. Let me tell you something, Mr. Dozer. I am so glad. I am. I, it's, it was, as a fan, it was life-changing for me because I had one of the most fucking amazing times up at Battlefront when they had their debut show. Not only that, I wasn't the only crazy motherfucker. There was over 300 people in this Elks Lodge, and it was amazing. And I kept going back. Ever since that one event, I went back for every motherfucking event because I had that good of a time up there. And it was just fantastic. But my point being, it takes all of us together to do that. See, it's not mutually exclusive, right? It's not just the workers. It's not just, you know, the, the, the people backstage and the backstage hands. It's not just the fans. It's all of us. So we, you and I have talked numerous times about it being... You know, stress relief for the wrestlers is also stress relief for the, for the fans. It's stress relief for the people who put production out because it's, you know, we get bogged down in our own personal bullshit, right? But for those two, three hours you're at that show, man, it, nothing else, nothing invades that space. It's safe. It's your fucking element, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it, it, and it's, it's stress relieving for the fans. It's stress relieving for us, and it, it you know, it, without you, look, the fans, we wouldn't exist. It's 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 and and people need to understand, like it's it's it takes refs, it takes production, it takes camera guys, it takes audio, but it also takes every fucking customer in that audience to make it worthwhile. Mm, and I, I for one have the utmost respect for our fan base, and I would never do anything to jeopardize that. Uh, at the chop shop, I've been there when there was five or six people, me being included, and my pop. I've been up at the chop shop where there's been about 20, 30 people. But I've also been at the chop shop when that fucking place was absolutely bonkers and people are standing against the walls. Uh, so yeah. it's, the same, it's the same thing with music. I've played to one guy sitting at the fucking corner of the bar the entire goddamn night. <laughs> but you do it. It doesn't matter. That's your job. You get up on that stage and you start kicking some ass. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a performer. I, I, you're a performer. 
you're a performer yeah. that so so I don't give a fuck if there's two people in the audience, they're paying customers, they pay to see wrestling, they're gonna get their fucking money's worth. At least when it comes to my match. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you uh, still got you, I have, you still I, got I, a I job to do. You know, I, I, so I remember you talking with, with Jacqueline about faction wars, right? And and we were running up against two separate shows that night and you know, a lot of our guys were double shotting it and we had seven fucking people in the crowd for a year and a half build up and a, and a payoff of a, a, a match of that. And we walked in, it was deflating at first. I'm like, nah, fuck it. Nah, no, nah, these seven fans, they're going to get the fucking show of their lifetime. And we fucking killed it <laughs> because I, I, it's, it, we owe it to them. They made it out here. So we're not going to stiff them. We're not going to shortchange them. They made it out here. They're going to get a show they'll never forget. They're going to have memories they'll never forget. And it's because we are performers. We are, are tasked to do a job and entertain. So, God damn it, get out there and entertain. So, let me touch upon that then. Um, you're saying, and, and I know you kind of reiterated it, but what you're saying is, because this isn't just my show. because <laughs> I've never said it's my show. This is our show. This, this is for people to get to know x person or what have you uh so what you're telling us is that when it's game time a year and a half build up storylines you guys already have your match is pretty much set you know what you're going to do you know how your evening's going to be set up but when you walk in you get that setup going you look from the back and you're like motherfucker where is everybody it does tweak your brain i've been there my friend it does tweak your brain but what you're saying is you're not changing up your matches. Whatever you set up is, is just set in stone, and you're not going to be like, you know what? I'm not putting my body through a bunch of bullshit for seven people, so let's cut this out. Let's change it to this, and let's do this instead of that. What you're saying is what's set in stone in your head for your matches and all of these crazy things you got going on, that never changes no matter how many people are sitting out there. Not for me, not for me at least. And and my mindset going into that match because I was one of the guys who helped call the match and plan that match out. Um, it, it never changed in my mind from the opening bell to the final bump. It never fucking changes. Now there are some guys, absolutely, they will scale it back, they will dumb it down, they'll give you indie wrestling bullshit one on one, or they work a fucking rest hole for tw for ten minutes and they scramble into a finish into a roll up and they're up the fucking dog taking three bumps. Um, I, I was never taught that way. I was never built that way. And, um, you know, it never, it never crosses my mind to dial something down or, or take something away. It's, you know, the match is the match regardless of 500 fans or five fans. And you, you, I go back to, you know, watching a DVD of the Chi town rumble with Ricky steamboat and Ric Flair with 20 fans in the audience. Cause it was a blizzard that night. You know. Mm -hmm. They still delivered a five-star match. They didn't dial anything back because they go out there and they went and they did they did their job. For those twenty fans, they got a hell of a show. You know what I'm saying? It, you can't beat it. Now, do you feel that it was a regular five-star match or it was a Dave Meltzer five-star match? Because there's many. There's two, that's two different. <laughs> no, I, can't, I, can't, I cannot speak for Dave Meltzer. I don't want to speak for Dave Meltzer. He does. He has a really good job on his own. Uh, so <laughs> I will say, in my opinion, as, as one of those formative matches of seeing is coming up from a kid, that was a five-star match in my eyes. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Anytime I hear, fine. Fine, dude, anytime I hear those words together, five-star match, Meltzer get, hits my brain because of all of the stars. That <laughs> well, I think Meltzer would probably give it three and a half stars and say it was the worst match. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fuck. Uh, well, we've been talking about many aspects of the behind. And I, I didn't know where it was going when I gave you the reins to kind of start this stirring the pot. Uh, it it could have gone in a thousand different directions. Uh, anger, I thought, was one of them. I'm glad ah! I kind of did. <laughs> I'm over that shit, brother. I'm too over to stop all the time. I'm glad it, it kind of... It stayed conversation with friends as such. That was very, very cool. Uh, but where I'm going with this is we've talked the business. We haven't talked no Chris Dozer. And before it gets a little too late into this interview, I want to see what's going on with Chris Dozer. Obviously, you made a breaking uh, news announcement. 
about the RWA thing. Uh, you'll be moving on. If nobody caught that earlier, uh, Mr. Dozer will be moving on from RWA. Uh, we're sad to see him go, but sometimes you just got to move forward. Um, so besides that, what does Mr. Dozer have going on? You know, right now, um, it's a lot of wait and see approach with wrestling, see what comes back. Uh, I know in October we had a watch this fight show that was booked, planned, uh, COVID compliant, whatever the fuck you want to call it. And the weather fucking shut us down. Mm -hmm. um, it was it, another kick in the balls and a series of kick in the balls in 2020. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, so right now, what we're looking forward to is 2021, uh, probably when the, the weather turns warm. Um, there's definitely shows that are going to be running, whether it's whether it be watch this fight, round championship wrestling, a combination, proving round will be running again, I'm sure. Um, it's one of those things where it's a wait and see approach. Uh, and I always have my ear you know, out, open, looking to go somewhere else, looking to do somewhere else. If someone wants to book me, absolutely. I'm, I'm all ears. Um, so it's one of those things where you don't know what the future holds. I know I am going to wrestle again. I'm not sure where. I'm not sure when that will be. I'm not sure who it will be for. I guarantee you it will be one of a handful of companies, uh, whether it be Round Chips of Wrestling, Proving Ground, or otherwise. Um, but it's not. It, it's it's so hard to, to say and pinpoint what's going to happen. Like, we're going to get a building. There's no definite we're going to get a building in the next three months, four months, five months. There's no definite that COVID's going to go away, uh, away anytime fucking soon. Remember, we quarantine two weeks to flatten the fucking curve and that was in march it's now december mm -hmm. and we're still trying to flatten that fucking curve mm -hmm. so it's 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 up in the air um i do know that my partner greg and i uh we're gonna continue to wrestle um and, and we're gonna see where it takes us we're gonna handle it on a case-by-case -case basis you know if something pops up that piques our interest absolutely we're down there we're gonna be doing and we'll be doing doing the shot there but i can't right now i'm focused mainly um, on the company I'm helping out, Rhode Island Championship Wrestling, making sure they're in good footing financially, uh, wrestling-wise, you know, angle-wise, it's going to somewhat make sense if we can. And, oh, sorry, baby. <laughs> My wife. better half. Hi, better half. Better half. half. Sorry. No, don't apologize. No worries. <laughs> I love yeah. photo bombs. Don't, don't sweat it. <laughs> <laughs> but like like I said, like you you don't know, um, but I do know what once we get back going and once RCW finds a place, we're gonna be running like we used to, uh, whether it's you know in conjunction with the chop shop companies or if it's a standalone with a couple of other offshoots, you know you know I like I said I I have no problem traveling to Connecticut mm -hmm. to work. I have no problem doing that. I have no problem traveling to Maine, New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts. Southern Rhode Island, New York. Like I said, I, wherever the wind takes us is where I would is where I like to go. I'd love to, you know, one of these days I'm going to come down and see the Tesla Strength Wrestling Show because uh, I've I've watched some of the stuff on the interwebs and YouTube, and it's 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 a great time there. You've know, got got a great core group of people down there. It, but, it, it is it is tons of fun. Tesla Strength um, has definitely kept me going uh, mm -hmm. because they have had uh, the chance to put on a few shows during this whole mess. Uh, it was outside under a pavilion. Tons of fucking fun. Oh, my God. Absolutely. <laughs> Those are the shows that I love doing because, like, it's the it's a nervous anticipation of you don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And you get there, and it's just fucking, like, balls out fucking blast. You know what I'm saying? Speaking of not knowing what to expect, whenever Karen Bam Bam dethroned Dan the Man... Watch we that video, lost brother. our absolute, we lost our absolute shit. I mean, the queen has arrived. She took down Danos. Holy cow. What a fantastic day that was uh, for all of us. I think even the GMIC, Alex Rojas, very relieved that Danos' reign was finally cut to an end. Oh, mm -hmm. man. Good, good times at Tessa Strain. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, on the tail end of this, before I do let you go, um, I spoke to Ms. Sparks, and I know even previously in May, we spoke of Ms. Sparks, uh, Mr. Dozer kind of relationship there, what's going on uh, 
And she did mention you are her trainer uh, on both occasions. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do, though, is because if you've watched Miss Sparks uh, video, uh, this past interview on Saturday, did you see her smile so much? Yes. She was full of smiles. And it wasn't just because of her chow weenie, Ivy. I'm telling you, I love saying chow weenie. Uh, but uh, the smiles that came from her was talking about those memories and her yeah. matches and such. Uh, so what I'd like to do on the tail end of this, I would like you to kind of go through. There was a match that happened between you, yourself, Chris Dozer. He was holding a strap at the time. Nice. And then yep. Miss Jacqueline Sparks came in as a number one contender. And things changed over at RCW, RICW. So for you personally, I would like you to kind of maybe sit back a little bit, take us through that day or take us through the match or whatever, because I know there's some good memories from that match. There has to be. So Absolutely. if you could just take us through that day, sir, uh, because of what the relationship is with Miss, Miss Sparks and Mr. Dozer, give us some insight on how you kind of took that day in. So, like I said, it was. My, my my relationship with, with, with Jacqueline Sparks, um, she's one of my best friends. Well, the fuck? <laughs> oh, my God. You mentioned Jacqueline Sparks and her full name, and the camera shut off. <laughs> hang on. What the hell? Hang on. Let me get this going. Eh? What the hell happened? <laughs> Sorry, Miss Sparks. <laughs> right? <laughs> Holy so, hang on. Hang on. I'll be back in one second. Apparently, my phone <laughs> shut off by itself. <laughs> There we go. Oh, I'm back. I'm back. Hey, there it is. There, <laughs> there, there it is. <laughs> no, but uh, like she's real life. She's one of my best friends. Like, uh, um, and I never expected that to happen. When I first actually laid eyes on her, um, she was with her boyfriend Chaz, and she was at a wrestling show, um, and she had a love for the wrestling business for a while, and you know. She mentioned that she was training. And she was she was going to be a wrestler. I said, okay. Um, and it sort of piqued my curiosity because I wrestle and I I lend a hand in training a lot of times when, you know, I see people that are genuinely passionate about the business. Um, I try to give them as much help as I can because they need all the help they can get. Right? So when I approached her about you know, me working for RSW and, and becoming the head trainer, uh, I wanted to work with her and see you know, where she was. And we worked a match, and she told, talked about that match. It was the first match uh, against me, and she was terrified, scared shitless. And um, after that match, we went back, and she was scared because she thought I'd be pissed off, upset, angry. Um, I don't care. It's hard to get me like that pissed off unless you're taking liberties or taking shots at me, you know what I'm saying, or taking trying to shoot on me. Um, but it, it was more of, hey, I think it's time to take a step back a little bit. Maybe you need a little bit more training, a little bit more refinement. Um, you definitely need to, you know, polish a little bit what you're doing in the ring because you have the passion, you have the heart, your body is just not following where your brain is telling it to go at that point. Um, and to her credit, she took a step back for a year. Um, not, I don't know if anyone that would you know, literally say, Hey, I'm not going to wrestle for a year. I'm just going to train, but she did. And man, I put her through fucking hell. <laughs> I trained her the way I was trained and training for me is meant for two reasons. One is meant to condition you in such a way that no matter what you face out there, it'll never be worse than what you face in a training ring with me. Like it's going to prepare you for every possible scenario you could ever possibly come across. Um, so you can, your, 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 your muscles will know how to handle it. You're going by muscle memory. When you, if you get gassed out, if someone gets injured, uh, if someone tries to take liberties with you, uh, if a rope breaks, if the ring breaks, you know, I try to prepare them for every possible curveball thrown at them because you never fucking know but it's also meant to break you mentally to test your passion mm -hmm. to test the mindset because i hold professional wrestling on a pedestal and wrestling is a privilege 
it's not right. So if you're going to come in here and think you're going to train for a month and a half, learn the bumps, run the ropes, and think you're going to wrestle and wrestle me, and think you're going to have a walk in the park and do your indie bullshit, that's not going to <laughs> Um, strike, you strike for real. You have to have an intimate relationship with pain. You have to be able to understand, like, you're going to feel like a truck hit you for the next three days. You still have to get up, go to your shoot job, and do that, and then come back and we'll do it again next week and we'll keep doing it. Wash, rinse, and repeat until you're at a point where we, we can let the reins off you. You can go and do what you got to do. And to her credit, she did all of that. She went through hell. She. I don't know of any good wrestler, wrestler worth their salt, who's have it, who hasn't had that conversation in their mind. Should I be doing this? Is this mm-hmm. the right thing for me? Do I want to do this? You know, I've had that question numerous times. I still have that question numerous times when things happen. But she had that question posed to her. And it was, you, if you want to stop now and walk out the door and tell me I'm an asshole, that's fine. That's fine. But if you come back here, you come back here to train as a worker. Not coming back here to valet. You're not gonna come. You're not gonna come in here and come through these doors again. You're coming in here as a worker. So, um, and and she had a lot of tough nights where she went home crying, where um, she couldn't walk well, or she had you know dislocated shoulder, possibly concussed. You never know. But those are the trainings you need to have because like, it beats respect into you, and it makes you either love this business or fucking hate it. No way, no two ways about it. She came through all that with flying colors, and we ran for a solid year and a half as Salvation. And it was myself, Jack Kruger, and Jacqueline Sparks. And when that disintegrated, um, I was asked, um, who do I want to face? Well, I mean, I've pretty much at that point faced almost everyone on the roster as champion. The only person I hadn't faced in recent memory, was Jacqueline Sparks. And we were both friends. It was not a heel-face sort of thing. It was mutual friends. I gave her the opportunity. Uh, You know, going into that match, she was nervous. She was definitely nervous because it's a big moment, a big spot, you know. And the thing I try to tell people all the time is it's very easy to get to the top, hard as hell to stay at the top and maintain. Like, it's the Consistency that people struggle with. Do you feel it's harder to get or to stay? To stay. To stay. Once you get that, anyone can ride that, like, catch lightning and bottle and catch that hot hand, and you go right to the top. It's uh, it's harder to to stay and stay for a while because you, you're you a target at that point. Everyone's gunning for you. You the people, the, If the promoter is doing his job, he's bringing in guys from the outside to work with you, to try and test you and push you to that next level. And you, you have to rise to every occasion and meet every challenge and mm-hmm. leave a lasting impression every single time you're at the ring. It's, 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 it's extremely difficult to do, and it, it, you can only do it for short bursts because I don't know anyone who can do what Bruno San Martino did mm-hmm. wrestling schedules we wrestle now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's easy to do it once a month in, in, in Madison Square Garden. Now if you're yeah. wrestling every weekend – Way fucking harder. <laughs> so it's it. We we get to that point, and you know she's nervous, she's anxious. And I told her like, listen, this is what you trained for. This is what you worked for. This is if this is your time, you need to go out. And you need to take it. You mm-hmm. can't just go out there and be satisfied with a normal, everyday performance. You got to go out. And you got to fucking kill it. And you got to mm-hmm. keep killing. It. And to her credit. In that match, I mean, we threw everything at each other we possibly could. We punched each other numerous times in the face. I couldn't put her down, um, and she couldn't put me down. And it, it came, uh, the finish came with a flash pin. I thought I kicked out at two. I kicked out at three. <laughs> and she beat me. She beat me clean. And uh, I have no ill will towards her about it because on that night, for three seconds, she was the best. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. I, for one, uh, it's so hard now, say, like trying to say it, but it's it's so weird. You work so hard with somebody to bring them mm-hmm. to a point, right? And you see them growing, and you see them finally starting to put the the, the pieces together or the puzzle, and like, okay, so that's the what behind the why, and 
that's the reason why we do this. That's the reason why we do that. They see him finally start to, to, to get the answers they're looking for. They sought so hard to get. And it's such a proud moment to see it all fucking pay off. Boom. This is what I worked so hard to get you to. Boom. Now you're the champion. Now you're the man. First ever female champion in New England. It, you know, and it couldn't have gone to a more deserving person because there was no one else in that roster. No one else in that building that outworked her. She worked her ass off to get that. And then she deserved every single accolade she got because mm. it was not handed to her. She had to earn every single spot she got. Mm. That that's a, that's an amazing buildup because I I don't know if I could train somebody, then get in the ring and then punch them in the mouth. I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> it's a strange breed, brother. Like I, I'm wired to the most. Like I said, I'm, I'm a, I I was trained um, that no matter who's standing across the ring from you, male, female, um, they're a worker, they're a wrestler. So. They deserve the same respect that everyone else came before you got and anyone else after you gets. You're going to hit hard. You're going to hit fast. You're going to hit often. And you know, I'm gonna, anyone who wrestles me, I punch him in the mouth. Like, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. It's going to happen. So how long were you champion before this match happened? My God. I believe that one was my 583rd day as champion. I was the longest reigning RICW Shut Universal Shut the champion. fuck up. <laughs> And Miss Sparks dethroned you? Hmm? Wow. Hmm. What? Now that's a feat. Uh, yeah, no yeah. doubt. I mean, I faced I mean, the ace, Mike Montero. We wrestled twice, once in a ladder match. And I was lucky enough to get the better of him. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamie Tucker, we had a killer Ironman match. I was lucky enough to, 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 to escape with a W there. Little Daddy Bravo, I beat him twice. Great matches. Kaz Marinelli a handful of times. Jack Kruger. Um, the list continues, um, but there's a lot of guys out there that they threw at me. Multi-man matches, Vinny and Bruzy in the tables match, where both of us ended up going to the hospital. Like, those are – a lot of people had their opportunity and took their best shot. And I mean their best shot. And they kicked the absolute bag out of me. On that night, she was better. Hmm. I can't explain well, it. It's just one of those things where it's just – get to a certain point and boom we've congratulated her on stirring the pot uh she's a fine champion she's still yes. the champion um no, i no. even i even touched upon with mr marinelli about should there be an asterisk next to her name not just her not just her specifically uh but in general with what's going on with the pandemic uh do we put an asterisk next to her name uh She's been a year and a half champion. Or do we say she was a champion for three months and COVID hit. So she's a three months champion. Um, I don't know how all companies are working because, I mean, I'm not privy to that. Uh, Mr. I mean, Marinelli. Oh, God. I mean, it, it's so hard to do that because, uh, you know, anything could have happened. The world could have ended the next day and she would have been the last known RSW Universal Champion on record. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's. It's hard to say, like, I'm going to put an asterisk here. I will say this. Um, for 583 or 84 days, I defended my title against anyone who's come, who's come knocking on my door. You know, anyone who came to the ring who wanted a chance at the title, I gave them that opportunity. People took their best shot. Money Bosch took their shot, like I said. Everyone, you know, I, I fought every single one of those 583 days. She's only had three title defenses to this point. Um, so there's a lot still left to prove with her mm -hmm. as champion, but if you're going to slap an asterisk in front of her, you know, after her, her championship reign, then every champion that hasn't run is an asterisk next to their name. It, it, exactly. And that's what I was saying in general, but I just use Miss Sparks as an example. Uh, I, I do have a quick question. Do you have a midget cleaning your house or something? There was a hand. It popped out of nowhere. It grabbed the laundry basket and it disappeared. <laughs> Is there a midget running around there somewhere? That's my wife. Say hi, Steph. Oh. Come on. Oh well. Oh, we didn't. We. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't happen to see a person. I just saw a hand grab a basket. I was like, wait a minute. He's got a midget working for him. What the hell's going on over there? It's a slave labor. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> You've got Botswani children. 
uh, cleaning, cleaning your clothes right. on the hush hush. You know, they're born exchange students. Don't worry about it. You know, they, you know, don't worry about it. They sleep well outside. Don't worry. If I didn't ask you that question before I let you go, it would tweak my brain. I'd never sleep at night. I saw the light. I saw the smoke. Uh, Mr. Dozer, uh, this has been an absolute fantastic follow-up uh, from six months ago. We chit-chatted like a couple of friends, uh, like a couple of menches, hanging out talking wrestling. <laughs> and it was, very, it was very cool to just hang out and talk some wrestling with our friend Chris Dozer. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, your anytime, insight. Anytime, yeah. anytime you want to do this again, I will happily be on here. This is, oh, this wow. is always a blast with you. Wow. So I guess we have the next uh, 24 days. Mr. Crow, uh, Mr. Dozer is going to be sitting with us uh, for the next 24 <laughs> days. We'll see how yes, that sir. goes. Why not? Why not? <laughs> uh, your insight, your opinions, your candor, uh, and, and the story of Miss Jacqueline Sparks, I've been wanting to kind of pull out of you a little bit because I know we touched upon it, but never really kind of yanked the chain on that one a little bit. So I appreciate everything you gave us on Stirring the Pot. It was a fantastic session today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, brother. Anytime, anywhere. We'll do it again. Absolutely, man. This was awesome. Uh, this was Stirring the Pot with Don Kincaid and my very special not one guest, but two guests. We had two guests. We had a random midget grab a basket, <laughs> and we had Mr. Chris Dozer. Thank you, my man. Anytime, brother.